So in the connection here between what Lynn has been teaching and Samuel is, you know, we have Eli and Samuel and their sons, Hophni Phineas for Eli and uh, Joel and Abijah for Samuel. And they were really not getting the accountability that they should have had. And they, they straight and caused problems for the, for the body. And so uh, that's the tie-in here with this. And as some of you may or may not be aware, I was um, involved with the Restoration Discipline Committee here at Southeast for a number of years and um, helped to develop some programs for how to deal with that. So we're gonna kind of go through that. So why study this? Uh, these are, there's some, let me move here. Why are, we, why are we studying this today? Some of that I mentioned, we'll get, we'll get into this, but these are the points for the study today. What is the spirit in which, they, in which we should take action? So we'll go through what that means briefly. Um, who are we to judge? Uh, who has the authority to judge? These are things we always hear, well, who are you to judge me and things like that. So we'll go through that and what the Bible has to say about that. And um, what is the case for excommunication or breaking fellowship? So that's the one thing that the church as a body can do if somebody is unrepentant and not penitent, we can, um, we can re reject their fellowship of the church. Uh, so let's, we're going to start with a couple of Proverbs uh, since we're talking about discipline restoration. Jack, could you go ahead and, and read uh, the Proverbs 1-7 and the uh, Proverbs 12-1 for us? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge but he who hates reproof is stupid. Okay, I, you know, that's ESV, and I, I, had, I, I, had, I had to put that in there because I thought that was just too good. You know, you don't ever say the Bible, you're, the Bible saying somebody's stupid, but, uh, but that was pretty good, pretty good. The stupid reference is uh, Proverbs 12, 1. So, uh, end of the, and I, you know, please, if you guys have got questions through the process of this, this is not intended to be a lecture at all. Uh, I'd love to get feedback and questions from you guys as we go through this. So, why are we studying this? Well, part of it's obvious because it's in the Bible. Uh, and, and just as we study other things in the Bible, we should also study and be aware of this as well. So, that's part of the reason we're going through this. Um, we also need to understand that as we believe other things that Bible has to say, we need to believe this part as well. It should be given just as much credence as the other. So um, in, in, in this particular case, we have a warning here. Jack, would you read 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, please? Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Okay, you can read Jude 1, 4 as well. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Very good. So, you know, this morning, Ben was preaching about avoiding sin and stepping away from it, doing these types of things. We need to be, under, we need to understand, be aware that the, the devil is after us and he wants to defeat us as much as he can and make us not effective for the worship and for our lives. So we just need to keep that in mind. And we also need to understand in going through this that we do have a biblical responsibility for the discipline restoration process and we'll continue to go through that. Um, if we don't, uh, not only because, like Ben said this morning, not only does the individual suffer for, for not following, he goes into the path where he's into the death of sin, hold of sin, and um, that's not good for him. And it, it also applies to the church or Sunday school class for a small group if these things are left alone. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the spirit for which we take action. Um, it would be the absolute height of arrogance for me to stand here and say, well, this is what I think. It doesn't hold a lot of water. So where, where do we go? We're, we're going to go to the Bible first and understand that it's the foundation we have through God's word that gives us the spirit in which we should deal with this issue. Because this is not easy stuff. Um, this is, um, it's, it's one of these things that nobody really likes to talk about, the restoration, confronting somebody, something like that. It's, it's not an easy task. But there's, there's an important reason to do that. Um, 
And again, we need to follow, just follow what the Bible has to say about it, understand that we've got God's strength behind us following his word. It's not me, it's him. And so that's what we need to know. So uh, Jack, could you read 1 Corinthians 13.1, please? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Right. I think everybody's familiar with the love chapter in Corinthians. And uh, this is very true. Unless we've got credibility with somebody, it's really impossible. And, you know, you don't want to pull a Will Smith and start slapping somebody around the head and uh, expect them to really pay attention to you, have some credibility with that. So, um, and uh, Jack, would you read Luke 15, 32? This is from the prodigal son. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I want to hang him for just a second. Um, you all know the story of the prodigal son, I'm sure. Um, that is really what discipline and restoration are all about. I know a lot of people tend to want to define discipline as somebody, you know, uh, dressing you down or uh, something with a very negative connotation, but I would prefer that you understand and look at this as an athlete would look at the discipline of training to prepare themselves for whatever event they're going to be involved with and or training with the Bible to become a better servant for Christ. That would be a form of discipline. And again, the end goal of this whole process is for restoration. Um, this is just a critical point that we all share. Um, so we need to, uh, we just need to be aware of that and, and follow that. Uh, Jack, could you read Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 for us? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Yeah, and this just goes along with what I was saying. This is not, it wouldn't be, it's not me. It's not you. If you're talking to somebody about an issue, uh, it needs to be. Us not leaning on our own understanding, but leaning on God's word and what we get from the Holy Spirit that we should be doing in a given situation. Uh, the next thing is, shouldn't all sinners be welcomed? Well, yeah. You know, if we didn't welcome sinners, what would we have here? We wouldn't have anything. There wouldn't be anybody here. So <laughs> that's, that's the, the point. You know, the, the church is really, uh, it's a hospital for sinners. It's not a hotel for saints. We all know that, and uh, you all probably heard that cliche before, but that's very true. Um, but what we need to be aware of is that once you become a member of a church and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a different standard to be held to. Um, this is one that's not in my notes here, but the James uh, 3 1 says if you're going to be a teacher, you're going to be judged a little bit harder than if you were not. So that's one of those things that always gets me excited when I teach something. Um, yet, you know, that, that understanding is in there. So it's a great responsibility that we all have as believers to, uh, to be accurate with what we do. But we, we need to uh, understand where people are coming from. And, uh, you know, the question, another question, should we be judging anyone? And we'll deal with this in a little bit further. Um, but there is an obligation of church leaders to keep the bride of Christ pure. And it's one of the charges, biblical charges that's out there. So it's not an easy task, and particularly in a larger church like this, it's not easy at all because there's a lot of people. But what you got to understand is the first line of defense is you and me. And you, if we're aware of something that's going on, we need to step in. And hopefully this lesson will help prepare you for some of this, uh, how, you, how this can happen. Again, restoring people is what it's all about. Jack, could you read um, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, please? 5, 6 through 7, excuse me. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. Un unleavened. Okay. What do y'all think this means? Somebody's got a club. A little bit can spoil the whole That's true. A little bit of what? Sin. Spill the sin. Yeah. And where does that apply? It, it, it applies with us if that's that one thing like Ben was talking about this morning you get that one thing that you step that step that way to go there where you know you shouldn't be going that can be cancerous it can be cancerous with a small group it can be cancerous in this class it can be cancerous in the whole body we'll, we'll see a little bit more about this in just a second 
Okay, so here's the biggies. We're getting into some good stuff. So who are we to judge? <coughs> Jack, you want to read Matthew 7, 1 through 2? Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Right. How many of y'all heard that one before? <laughs> Yeah, and what do you what do you do with what do you do with that one? Personally, you have to have a context. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's true. Well, again, you go to the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. You let the Bible tell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think for a lot of people. This keeps people from engaging in that process. Because if you look at this, it's, it sounds pretty strong. And it is pretty strong. So we just need to understand what the context of that is in part. Yeah, I think we should also realize we live in an era in a world where personal autonomy is everything. Yeah. And we, we believe in moral relativism. So this, you have no right to tell me what's right and wrong. And I have no right to tell you what's right and wrong. You have your truth and I have my truth. So this is particularly dangerous for people to latch onto that verse and then hit you with moral relativism. It, 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 you're going to hit it every time you try to draw a distinction. Absolutely. That, that's, you know, that's, and that's where our culture is today. I mean, it really um, is really inhibiting our culture. It's inhibiting the church to be the church and for both to be brothers and sisters to each other. I don't think it's possible to not make a judgment just because, you know, you notice that something is either right or wrong or something is black or white or whatever, or to make a judgment on that. That's but exactly right, yeah. Maybe how you manage it, um, if, if it causes you to be unkind to someone or to treat them badly, mm -hmm. um, that maybe maybe your attitude toward the judgment that you make. I don't know. I don't know that I know we make judgments. We have to make judgments. We have to be able to discern right from wrong and good from evil and we're in a battle right now in our country um, with versus evil we have to be able to see that and judge it so and act accordingly yeah you're exactly right the uh, the greek word here for judge is krino k-r-i-n-n-o and um i think i might have that get this time for another slide what's next this? This right, okay. well this is the sad bar so anyway i'm gonna go i'm gonna go back and forth there we go so krino uh, that's a good and what it means in context is either to understand what's right and wrong or to condemn and in this particular case it doesn't mean to condemn because guess what and this is a good thing we can't we can't condemn not for the pure meaning of condemn which is, and that's a that's a good thing um so it, it's again understanding the context um let me slide down here so um Jack, would you read John 8, 7 through 11, please? And as they continued to ask him, that is Jesus, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. <clears throat> but not today. He didn't condemn her today. If she doesn't accept with this particular case, uh, she doesn't accept Christ as Lord and Savior, that's the end result would be condemnation for her eternal condemnation. But he, he is, here he's showing mercy. Um, uh, and he's, he's teaching the people that were there a lesson as well to be merciful because they were going to stone her. They were going to kill her. So um, that's just understanding we have to have mercy involved in this again, the spirit of which we enter into these things. Um, Jack, would you read Matthew 7, 4 through 5, please? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, 
and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right, anybody get a good work picture of that in their mind when you hear that one? <laughs> I mean, it's always hard to imagine a plank in your eye. Uh, it doesn't sound very comfortable to me, but again, um, this is not what it, if you if you understand the purpose of restoration, you understand what's going on here, understand that this shouldn't be something that would deter you from fulfilling the role of helping somebody out. Um, but I think this is another one of those verses. I think all three of these verses are ones that um, tend to make us not want to go down that road. Um, but it's, again, it's just a matter of having a better understanding of what's being said here. It doesn't mean not to. Go ahead, Beck. Well, also, you need to consider the parties involved. Are they believers or not believers? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of hard to expect non-believers to act like believers. Well, the believers can still should bring it up and be that person too. Absolutely, right. and so are some of us. <laughs> well, uh, to be put this into everyday lives, we have people in our families. Uh, have you approached this? Do you say, "I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more." Mm -hmm. I don't condemn you, but if they keep on sinning then where is where does the judgment and the condemnation right right so tell me <laughs> you got it. okay here's a here's a here's a great example and i don't you know this could be a brother sister could be just anybody well i don't mean maybe i shouldn't have said condemn but no, no, I, uh, I, not judge it. and accept yeah yeah can accept do we accept them in their continuing sin? First of all, I would say that would if you were standing on a street corner somewhere and you saw somebody walking towards a corner that was getting ready to walk across the street and there's a bus coming, you'd grab them, you'd stop them. And we need to understand that in a spiritual sense, this is the same thing. We need to love our brothers and sisters enough or anybody. We need to love anybody enough to stop them from stepping in, in front of an oncoming bus. They will not, yeah. cannot stop them. Yeah, and sometimes we can't stop them, and it's tragic. Some of, some of the stuff that happens when people make bad decisions, like Ben was talking about this morning, people making bad decisions and ending up in a very bad place because of the decision. Connie? And, but between church and, and our class, we were listening to a radio deal that the guy, he was a, a congressman, and he said, never in America's history have so many in our government wanted to increase abortion mm. what do we do with things like that well register to vote 50 percent of people <clears throat> vote aren't registered so register vote and vote <clears throat> and understand the platform that you should be voting for i mean that's that's the big thing i mean that's and i think reaching out to those people individually to you know that your representatives and tell them please don't do that part that that i think the a better illustration of that <coughs> is where uh, Bishop Chaput, for example, refuses to provide communion mm -hmm. to President Biden. Exactly. And the reason he does that, because Biden claims to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, of Roman Catholic Church. And therefore, it, it, because abortion is so contrary to the, to, the, to the morals of the church, he feels obligated to exclude him from the sacraments. That would be a better example. As far yeah. as big pagans being pagans, they're going to be pagan one yes. way or the other. And, and I think that's what your illustration would be. Those who are unbelievers are going to do evil things. If they do, we should do all we can to preach the gospel and, and warn them. But they, they don't belong to the church. So they don't apply to this matter, <coughs> matter of discipline. Except that then we're supposed to pay for the abortion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, the idea, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I serve on the board at uh, Beside You for Life the pro-life pro pregnancy center. Um, it just makes me sick that my tax dollars are being used for that. Um, they're, they're, there's money being donated from the government to Planned Parenthood, um, which they in turn use for donations to political candidates, put them back in office so they can vote for stuff like this. But which apparently is the thing. it's not just a few. They're saying no, there there's are not, more. No. There are more than yeah. ever. And uh, I'm going to bring this back into just the body of the church. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Joe Bidens out there that say that they're a member of a church and would still vote for something like that. And that's a shame of it. And frankly, I think this priest is doing, the bishop 
is doing exactly the right thing. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. I want to, I want to answer your question. Mike. One thing I would suggest is that uh, there may be an appearance that there's so many more, but they're more vocal. And right now, if you become vocal against that, you're ostracized. So I don't know that there's more, more are speaking out. And it's incumbent upon us as Christians to be bold and to speak out also, but to speak out in love. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I think, you know, we see, if you look at some of the polls, and I don't have any poll information from me right now, because that wasn't really what I was, where I was going with this whole thing today. But um, I understand the majority of Americans, when they're polled, do not favor abortion, and that is getting better each year. Well, hopefully this summer, June, July, we'll overturn Roe v. Wade, which will put the decision back in the hands of the states. And that's why we've all seen, I think we've already seen like 13 states put up laws and, and legislation to help support even the, the abortion, abortion pill, which is being sold as a whole other thing, which it's not, um, but it is an abortion pill. It's ending a life. And so that's part of what's going on. So it's it's a long play. That's all I can say. It's a shame that we live in a country with the, in a post-Christian world, but that's where we are. So voting and not being apathetic and taking action, which I'll bring back into this. We need to take action when we see our fellow brothers and sisters doing something they shouldn't be doing. And that, that helps it helps us all. We don't end up with some of the stuff we end up with. Um, Jack, yeah, please read um, James 5, 19 through 20. Brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, isn't that what Ben was saying this morning? And isn't that what we all know? But here again, it tells us that if you're wondering, if somebody brings him back, well, what, what did that person do? It was bringing him back. What did he do? He or she did. He spoke truth. They spoke truth. They made a judgment. They saw good and wrong, good and bad. This is bad, so they're going to go in and correct. We see this all over the place. And uh, this is a good point to note here. And Connie, I'm still going to get to your question when we get to there's another section. I want to answer that. That's how things are specifically dealt with uh, in the church anyway. And we can go there in just a little bit. Um, again, we, when we approach somebody that's caught up in some sort of a sinful lifestyle, um, we need, to, we need to approach them, but we have to do it with a, a, a purpose of restoration. We have to do it with love, and we have to do it with showing mercy. And we also need to learn that we have to be patient. These things didn't happen overnight. It's like the, the, this goes back to 1972, four, four, 73 with Roe v. Wade. Yeah, so it, it's, this has gone long, a lot longer than it ever should have. Uh, this, this not, it's just embarrassing as an American to have that in our history. Um, but, um, again, um, it, it just starts with the individual. Like I said, in a church of, I don't know how many people are averaging on a given weekend, that 30, 35,000 people with all the campuses and all that type of thing. Uh, you got an elder body of maybe 10, 13 people. And that's where this is being handled here. Now, how do they handle it all? Well, they can't handle it all. That falls back on our, on our shoulders. It has to start as a one-on-one, -on -one. and that's where the credibility really is. If you don't know who an elder is, but you've got another brother or sister in Christ that you're close to, I mean, who are you going to listen to first? It's probably going to be the friend, brothers, or a family member, something like that, that's going to get your attention first. Yes, Beck? Well, I mean, I know we've all probably done this, but I've had it inside my family and outside my family where I had to go to them and, and speak the truth to them in love. Your, your motivation of why you're doing it is very important. You're not doing it to to destroy someone. You're doing it because you're you're wanting to restore them. And um, yeah. And you know, fortunately, in the couple of instances I'm thinking of where I've had to go do that, it has the Lord has blessed when blessed them when they have returned to Him and the Lord to do it. But uh, it's not easy. No, Your it's not easy. Is out of love and to restore them. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's a quick play. Sometimes it's a really really long play. I know there's people in here that have been praying, praying for wayward children for a long time. And this is not too dissimilar of an issue. We just have to we have patience. Um, Jack, could you read Galatians 6.1 for us, please? Brothers, if any 
one is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Very good. Did you guys know there were so many verses about judging people in the Bible? <laughs> I, got a, I got another good one coming up later to really nail it down. It's really, it's uh, again, we can depend on God's word. He, he equips us for different situations, life situations that we have to go through every day, every year, whether it's family or friends or whatever. We, we are equipped if we just turn to God's word. So studying God's word and understanding it is really critical. So who has the authority to judge? This might be a little redundant because of what we've just been saying, but um, let's go back to the Old Testament. Do you remember what David did with Bathsheba? Who confronted him? Nathan. Okay. Yeah, Nathan did. And so Nathan judged. And granted, he's a priest, um, but he judged. He's a human being like you and I are. And he deserves between right and wrong. And, and David was judged and found uh, he, he was. The story is a great story. It's too long to read here, but go back and read that again. Because um, David was like, who is this guy? I want to go after him myself. And they said, it's you. It's you. And aren't we sometimes? Aren't we sometimes? Um, but anyway, so um, Jack, could you read uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, please? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Yeah, how about that one? That's, um, I can start stepping on some toes. Uh, we're going to read this whole chapter in just a little bit, but I want to want to just pull this one out at this particular point in time, uh, just to have that in your hip pocket. Jack, could you read uh, Proverbs 27, 17, please? And then go ahead and read. Iron sharpens up. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. All right. There's another pretty direct challenge. And how do, you, how do you know to sharpen the other? Something going on that you didn't, uh, didn't think was right? More than likely. Or it could be just simply from helping somebody to, to grow spiritually. Uh, just encourage, being an encourager, which is part of the role that we should have in a spirit of how we deal with these issues. Um, and Jack, go ahead and read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Everybody probably already knows this one, but go ahead and read that, please. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Very good. So again, it mentions in your not only teaching, like I just mentioned, to mentor somebody and be an encourager, but also for reproof. And correction, we see examples of this in the Bible as well, um, where people are being corrected to preach accordingly and to speak accordingly when they're, when they're teaching people. Um, so again, I think an easy way for me to look at this has always been that we're really fruit inspectors. It's really what we are. We see people, the fruit of people's lives and, and um, the good and bad. And if it's good, we can certainly encourage them. Though, and and uh, we should be doing that. Uh, and I think in general, people are, are good about doing that. But the part... <coughs> Of, of confronting people with something that's not good is, is, is very challenging. I mean, nobody wants to burn a bridge. Nobody really wants to um, confront somebody with a sin. It's just, that's awkward. It's tough. It's tough. So, but where we should get our strength is from where? From the Holy Spirit, from God. And, and where do we get our knowledge in which to deal with these things? That's God's word. Yeah, exactly. So, um, again, I'm, I'm glad that we don't have the power to send people to heaven or hell. Uh, that's clearly God's plan that we have a certain amount of authority. Um, but it's God and Jesus that have the power to judge and condemn. Um, so that, that one slide was just a, it's a better protecting the church. And we have a, in our, our personal lives, we need to be protected as well. And this is the way we did just, Jerry. I think we need to remember when we're speaking God's truth into someone else's life, it's not me. I'm not saying that. I'm not judging. God's word is doing the yeah. judging. Yeah. And, but that's the key. We have to make sure that we're speaking God's word into their lives, not my thoughts, yeah. my, my judgments. Yeah, you know, at that point in time, we can just say, here's what I see. Is this and true? Says this. And then, then here's what God's word says about this. What are you going to do? Now, what do you do? As a believer, what do you do? 
Um, it's it really afford it, it just is that simple. It really is that simple. Um, you know, Bart and I talked about this. He was talking about well, what what's really the criteria by which we identify sins in um, slide nine? So we're on now. Um, what is the criteria by which we we judge people? How do we the things that, that really can disrupt the church? It can be divisive in the church and, and hurt the witness of the church. Um, first of all, when you see it, address it. Don't. There's an old there's an old adage that I've always was very graphic and very easy for me to remember. If you got to eat a frog, do it while it's still a tadpole. Don't wait for it to come to come full size full size. You know. So it's a trust me. It's a lot easier to deal with these things when when they're fresh and when they're just getting started. Because what happens if people are after each other? It tends to be just the two people bumping heads. Uh, whatever that issue might be, but then it kind of gets family members and friends. Everybody starts choosing sides and it grows and it grows like leaven. It gets cancerous and it can be very disruptive to the whole body, not just the individuals alone, but the whole body. Yeah, Bobby. Well, it's, it, I remember uh, when that, I can't remember the fellow's name, Global killed his wife and he was going through all the court situation, yeah. but he's a member of Southeast Christian yeah. Church. Ignato. Mel Ignato, yeah. 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 And can you imagine that if some, I think it was Bob Russell that went to him and if he was still in this church, I mean, he could be forgiven for his sin. I mean, he, if he humbles yeah. himself, he can be forgiven for that sin. But the fact is that Bob said, you're going to have to leave because he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, recant. He would, he would not recant. No, he would not. He was not penitent about that. That would have torn the church up. That's where I think the leaven gets in and said, well, what, what are these different, these are different. Yeah, it, it, you're, you're exactly right. This is, and you know, it could be, it, it could obviously murder is obviously bad, but it could be adultery. It could be any number of sins. Uh, it could be drunkenness, gossip. Here's something: you know, we don't we blow right through gossiping. We blow right through that, or gluttony. We blow right through that one. But they're all they're all separation from God. Yes, Caroline. You just mentioned gossip. I was just going to make a comment on gossip that we had. Are you going to be talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the gossip also works as leaven. Yes. And years back in another church while Bart was in the Navy. Uh, there was gossip going around about one of the teenagers yeah. whose parents we loved. Mm. And, um, and so we went mm. to the dad in love to find, to find out the truth mm -hmm. and how, how could we come alongside you? And there was crying and there was, oh yeah. You know, it was just the beginning of a re relationship in an effort to, to heal and restore. But someone had to. Someone has to crack the egg. Be bold enough mm -hmm. to say, we love you. This is what is out there. Absolutely. We want to hear from you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've, again, when I was serving on the restoration committee here, I certainly got to see that. That first part of it is can be very ugly. Can, it's, it's, it's just tough. But knowing, let's take a divorce situation. Somebody wants to get divorced. God doesn't like divorce. We know he doesn't like divorce. He tells us that in his word. But if we can help intercede and get, get the people to understand they're involved, whatever the issue is, um, that God is powerful enough to take care of this. And look what God can do if, if, if you let him pull this thing back together Think of what a witness you could be for other people that are going through those same struggles, whatever your struggles are in your marriage, whatever that could be. Think of what story you'll have to tell and how God can use you in that regard. The painful things, painful. Um, uh, gosh, Broadshire, what's... Ross. But in his... Jean, Jean, no, the son, or their daughter, his wife, oh. Ross's ex. Oh, Debbie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, they their son got killed in a car wreck years ago, and they both witnessed to so many couples over that issue that had lost a child. And, uh, boy, I just can't, you know, that's not supposed to happen that way. We're supposed to precede our kids, not the other way around. Uh, but you can, God can use you in, in, in phenomenal ways um, through this whole, through this process as well as other processes in the Bible. Uh, I've just watched something the other day. Uh, it's an expose on Hillsong. Everybody familiar with Hillsong? Who yes. they are? The church? It's watching. on the Discovery Plus. It's three or four segments or something like this. Well, there's two guys. Uh, Brian Houston was kind of the 
his dad actually founded it and then he took the helm from there and then Carl Lentz when that was in Australia Carl Lentz was the United States leader of, of Hillsong well they both have fallen miserably in the, in a, and it's had a massive impact a negative impact on the church and other people in the church and yeah there's probably people that came to the Lord through through them even though their ways were misguided Carl or Brian's dad that really got him started. He was a serial pedophile, homosexual yeah. pedophile. Yeah. And that's just tragic. Yeah. But then Brian hit it. He yeah, knew it, he did. didn't do anything with it. Yeah. If this documentary is correct, yeah. uh, which I believe it probably is, because that's kind of the way the court saw it. So I'll let that, and he's not, he's, I guess he's been out for several years himself. And then Carl Lentz was multiple, and, and well, Brian also had multiple affairs outside of his, outside of his, uh, outside of his marriage. He was an adulterer. And Carl Lentz, the same thing. He fell into the sin. People knew this. Yeah. People knew it. Yeah. And yet, look what happened. Robbie Zacharias. Robbie Zacharias yeah. loved him. Yeah. He was a brilliant apologist. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and to see what happened there, my goodness. But had, you know, in his case, how could they not? How could somebody not know? Somebody knew. Yeah. But, you know, it's you know, owning a, a massage parlor when you're. <laughs> that didn't make sense. It didn't wash. Well, yes. So are you saying that um, somebody knew that they had maybe acted on that knowledge uh, and had made that judgment that this, these people are sinning and then they could possibly then maybe attempt to <coughs> correct that, to help them correct it, to bring them out of the sin and, and, and therefore save them in the ministry? That I don't think that. Yes, they could god can god can there's no doubt he probably zacharias do god's work in and out but he it had somehow gotten disconnected between his heart and his head uh, you know i had no idea i i see people in positions like that and you see it all the time unfortunately i don't know how to be that knowledgeable of god's word and yet succumb to the same old stuff that we've been succumbing to as people for eons that, that doesn't make sense to me Yes, Mari. I think some people become intellectually proud. No and doubt. He was very, I mean, nobody could argue with him. He was just so, you know, bright, so oh, yeah. articulate. And uh, I think pride enters in. It's always the reason for sin. Yeah. And then you start to think of yourself as being who people being God. say you are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's so easy to have that private lives that dark side. yeah too much power too little yeah. accountability it's and usually nobody been... believe no he had that dark side no 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 yeah and initially i was one of those with him with robin yeah. i did not I just thought that's got to be a bad rumor that can't be true yeah. and the more the more cans he opened up the more worms there were you know it was a bad deal jack uh could you read matthew 18 15 through 17 please if your brother sins against you Go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, um, first of all, you see here you see the individual involvement, one-on-one -on -one type scenario. You got a brother, or sister, sins against you. Go to them with that issue and say, "Is this what was going on?" And you try to deal with it there. If it continues on, and you take a witness or two with you. So again, more more first level. But the third thing here is to take it to the church. Well, that means taking it to the church leaders, and then the leaders would meet and work with that particular person or party that's involved in whatever's going on here. And then they would they would try to you know mediate this issue between two people or whatever the issue is or to get the person in the right path. And if they can't, then it's basically saying, well, what do y'all think it means when it says that if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a gentile and a tax collector? What does that mean? What what is you know, anybody would try to define gentile and tax collector here in this context? <laughs> They, they certainly weren't loving people, loving people from a Jewish perspective. No, they were not. Were they, they? Were very much outsiders yeah. and uh, yeah. segregated yeah. from society. Yeah. Absolutely. They were even called dogs. Yeah. Were called dogs. Oh, yeah. They were. Yeah. 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 Definitely at the bottom end of the uh, spectrum. 
bottom feeders. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on here. So with this, we're, we're kind of getting into um, where the church comes to play here and how the, what this process looks like. So, so they've turned it over to the church leadership. And, um, and so this is where it's going to be dealt with next because it hadn't gotten resolved on an individual level. So do you all recognize this, uh, this picture? Thanks to Bart for helping me put these slides in, by the way. Yeah, yeah, this is his trial. What was he being, what was he being tried for? What was his problem? Just right against some of the core beliefs of the church. Heretic, so right? Church. He's a heretic. Yeah, yeah. So that's what's going on there. Do you, indulgences. Yeah, he was going against the church. Tesla, yeah, Tesla was out selling indulgences to, you know, for, for just to basically, basically rip people off. And so he didn't like that. But he also saw several other things that he didn't agree with. And, you know, um, oh, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget this. Mark, do you remember the quote at the end of this? He said, if it, here I stand, I can do no other. May God help, help me. I stand upon the word of God. Yeah, yeah. His point was, if any of you can show me where my writings contradict the Holy Scripture, I will confess. Precisely. Because they were trying to make it an up or down vote. Did you yeah. write these things? If you say yes, you're a heretic. If you say no, you're lying. Yeah. So they, they had him trapped and he said, here I stand on the word of God. Because he could then ask him, well, then why? Tell me why. And they didn't want to answer that because they couldn't and still do what they were doing. Well, the Catholic Church didn't want the people to have an interpretation of the Bible or read the Bible in a language they could understand, a language the priest to interpret it to them. That way they could interpret to them what they wanted. So the people of Catholic sure. was against that. Yeah, and if you didn't know what the Bible had to say about tithing, you wouldn't understand what Tesla was doing when he came out and said, well, if you give me X amount of money, I'll get those, those family members yours, friends yours, out of, out of uh, Hades. You know, get our, our uh, purgatory. Purgatory. Yeah. purgatory, yeah, thank you. And uh, and he started also going, well, these are for your friends that do this in the future. You give me some more money, we'll take care of the ones that you don't know about yet, that have yet to come. It's kind of bad. Anyway, so, hey, Jack, could you read First Corinthians? Chapter five, please. And this is only like 13 verses, so it's not that bad. Uh, yes. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. And if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Yeah. Wow. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So, Connie, there's your, there's your case. There's a good case study that, that Paul gives us in his writing to the, to the Corinthians here. Um, yeah, let's, let's unpack this just a little bit. I mean, there was a lot there. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier that once you're, once you're a believer, you have a little higher standard to, to work with. So that's what we're, we're dealing with here. And as you see, there's a differentiation between inside the church, a believer, and outside, and who's to judge and who's to handle with that. 
to deal with that. So, so what 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 happened here first? What happened to get this ball rolling? Besides the gas leak, his father's wife. Let's just skip over that one. But what did Paul say? I hear that this is what's happening. So how did Paul hear? Somebody approached Paul, right? Somehow wrote him a letter. Well, yeah, matter because Paul wasn't physically there. They wrote it. I'm assuming that's how it got to him, or somehow. So that person took action, and Paul took action. So what was the second, What was the next thing that we that we see there with the Corinthian church? What's going on? Did they know what was going on? Yeah. Mark? I think it says that they were proud of their open mindedness. Yeah. We are so tolerant. Oh, that's man, you know, who doesn't want to be compassionate? They were I, I don't want to be back. I might have compassion for people. Oh, that's okay. It doesn't really mean that's not what the Bible really means. It says, you know, I've got to love this person. That's what it tells me, right? I got I'm supposed to love everybody. Yeah, yeah. This is something that this so what we got is nothing new to what we've seen in the past. Rachel, you have something? Okay. Um, so they were they were really proud of it. So he tells them, what does what does, what does Paul say? You shouldn't be proud. You should be mourning. You should be really upset that this is what's going on in your own backyard. And so, then, what, so what? Paul, what's Paul do next? I kind of, I kind of get tickled with this. What, what did Paul say next? He come out. He's out of here. I don't even have to come to town for this one. I can see what's going on here. He's out of here. This guy's just such a train wreck. This, he's out of here. So he charged him to remove him from the group. What would that symbolize? But yeah, there's that. But I mean, what we just learned about it's leaven, it's the bad apples oiling the barrel. That's what's going on here. So, for the sake of when, when does the church get engaged and what's going on here, this is where the church gets engaged is to save the body. Because you tolerate these things, you'll tolerate the next thing, and you enter back into a Romans 1 experience where you tolerate this, then you'll tolerate that. And then you start inventing ways to be perverse, is what we see in that. So, Paul says, don't even associate with this guy. Don't eat lunch with him. Don't play golf with him. You don't hang out. Just church leaders. So what do y'all think the purpose of that is? Why, why are we casting the person out? Why are we ignoring that person? What's, what's the purpose? So that he can feel the, um, I don't think the word is, he feels the loss and wants to change what he's doing in order to be insensitive. Exactly. Exactly. Because all you know, at that point in time, when we get to that point in this process, that's really the only card we have left. That's you know the biblical card. Yes, who? Well, is this talking strictly to church leaders? Is it strict? Is this talking to the body? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get, you know, given the situation, given the situation, and in each each of these situations, they all have their own. Reasons they all have their own time frame. Uh, the people either got into the problem or, get, or can get out of it. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, but it's, it applies to both the leaders as well. In this particular case, this is more towards the body because he mentions leaven in this in this chapter. You know, casting them out. So this is more of a protection for the body. Judge those inside. You judge inside. I'll take care of those on the outside. So this is this is really where church leadership needs to step up and follow what's going on here. And you know, I don't know how many just rhetor somewhat rhetorically, but if you get raised hand, you want to this line. How many people have really studied First Corinthians five before? Yeah. A couple. She lives with me, so she doesn't have a choice because that's <laughs> just a few. Yeah, this is one of those ones we don't hear a lot about, just because it's just kind of some tough territory here. So, um, let's see here. And I think it would be good for him to occasionally hear it. In context of the preaching to the church, so that members of the church will know this is what you can expect. Yeah, this is this is one of those things that I fought for uh, here was that not only does it deal with the person as we're being told here to give that person that absence of the body to let them understand um, you're you're mis you're making a mistake here. It, there's some cost to that. You're, you're going to miss fellowship with these people. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think it does, two things. First of all, I think it tells the rest of the people of church, hey, these guys believe what they preach. They believe what the Bible says, and they're standing up for it. And the, the, the third thing I think that it does 
it tells that it, it tells the person thinking about like Ben said, I want to go here. Huh, wait a minute, if I got to go through that, I don't think so. It, it can be a deterrent. It can be a big deterrent. Who wants? I mean, who in the world wants to go through that process to that extent? Uh, and, and technically, uh, what this is saying when it says go to the church, this means. And I, I talked to churches all over the country when I was on the board here about this issue. The only church which has now changed some, it's uh, Saddleback. They're the only ones that were really doing it like this says, and they they took it to the church. John's not following what the elder, he went through this process. Um, John's not doing what we ask him to do. And therefore, John is no longer a member of the, of the church. He's been cast out. And you should not have dinner with him, supper, play golf. You know, you just, this guy needs to go through this process because he's not, he's not done what he should do. And that was done. Not, you know, I talked to Piper's church. I talked to church, A.D. Rogers Church down in Memphis about Bellevue, Bellevue, yeah, Bellevue. other churches. Um, yeah, Brooklyn Tabernacle, other churches. Um, it's amazing. Everybody, well, yeah, we know we need to do it. We're not doing it. So that was made me more convicted about what we were doing here than it already was. And so we started down that path. Um, yeah, we're getting this is good. So here's hey, Glenn, can I ask a quick question? Yes, Jack. Uh, from your own experience on the Restoration Committee, um, uh, having been through the process many times, what? how would you... Uh, um, categorize the results. Were did you find mostly repentant hearts immediately? Did you find repentant hearts over time? Did you find that you were asking a lot of people to leave the church? That's a great question, and glad to answer that. Um, that was not part of what I had to, written down here, but that's a good one. I would say uh, what I saw God do was ninety-eight percent effective. Mm. It wasn't me. I only had, of all the things I had, I only had one guy that uh, did not want to go along with the deal. He'd been married for 18 years, three kids, shows up here at church with his girlfriend on his arm and runs into his family in the narthex. That's all I'm going to tell. <laughs> it's a good story. But he was the only one. I mean, it, it took, you know, I talked with him for weeks. And, um, you know, it just, it, it just never bore fruit. He said, well, you got, you know, I said, well, we're going to have to let you go. He said, well, you do what you got to do. I don't care. So he was not, he, he could have cared less. And that's tragic. I mean, I really wish, um, maybe I didn't have the right words to say at the right time with him, I don't know. But I really wish that um, that, that could have been resolved. Other than that, uh, Jack, um, yeah, we got, we got things resolved. Um, people gave God a chance, best thing I can say, to, to address that issue, yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. You're quite welcome. So, uh, here's some takeaways for you guys. Um, we now know, and you can dig further because there's not there's this is not uh, extensive. Uh, these verses that we've shared today is many many more things, uh, but we know that there's a biblical way of handling conflict or sin uh, in the body and in individuals. We know there's a, there's a way to handle this and be on firm ground. Um, again, just to understand. That the purpose of this whole process is not to shame somebody and guilt them into some, you know, just make them feel guilty for no reason or to elevate, just make yourself feel better because I'm holier than you are and I can tell you what you should be doing and all that type of thing. There's nothing to do with that, but it's to, but it's to be helpful um, to, to bring the person back. Like I said in James, it's you're, 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 and like Ben said, you're saving somebody from making a a bad mistake or recovering from a bad, a bad mistake in a good way. Um, understand that our judgment when we're making these things should be balanced in truth and love. The old adage is, you know, truth without love is brutality and love without truth is mush. And that there's, there's a whole lot of truth to that. So we, but we need to keep those, we need to keep that balance in mind. And um, then we need to understand it's, we do have a responsibility and we should take this seriously. And it involves studying the Bible, being more aware of what the Bible has to say about things. Again, what I would normally do is I would say, this is what I've heard to a person. Is this true? And they unbelievably quickly would say, yeah, that's what's going on. Well, here's what the Bible says about that. Now, what do we do? And I'd let them answer the question. I'd just read a verse and show the Bible and encourage them, of course, along the way to do that. So we, we need to be an, an advocate for our faith. Um, I think too many of us look at, at our world as, as a playground. We can just go out and, and have our own meaning to life and do what we're going to do and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think it's more important for us to look at this.
for what it is. It's a spiritual battlefield, spiritual battleground. And we need to understand, not that we always dwell in a negative world of, of, you know, of something like that, but we need to be aware that, that that's out there, that this stuff is real, that Satan is real. His, like Ben said, his, he's there. He's, he's like a roaring lion waiting to pounce and devour, to steal, kill, and destroy. I mean, we need to understand that that is really true. Um, and so that's the, that's the spiritual battle that we're fighting. And I think, lastly, just to wrap up, this is about loving your brother and sister. It's about compassion. And um, yeah, it's um, something, you know, it, it would, um, I, I know that people, I don't know personally, thank God, people that have children that have, what, have, have struggled in, in with their faith and have, have wandered away, it's painful. And to, to see something like that and understand that there was a better way that these people could go in the heavy burden to carry. Sorry for the emotion, but it is. It is. 